In this episode, we're diving into the fascinating world of clustering. We'll break down a simple yet powerful algorithm to group data points and watch the process come to life with colorful, interactive visuals. It's all about uncovering patterns and making sense of data in a way that's both intuitive and fun. Whether you're exploring clustering for the first time or just want a fresh perspective, this episode has something for you. Let's jump in. Today, we're tackling a classic clustering challenge using the K-means method. Imagine we've got some points scattered across a plane. It might sound simple, even a little dull at first. But trust me, starting with this example is the best way to truly understand how it works. And don't worry, in future episodes, we'll take it up a notch and apply this method to real-world problems you can actually relate to. Let's get started. Um, when you look at these points, what's the first thing your brain does? For me, it immediately starts searching for structure, trying to group the points into something that makes sense. It's almost automatic, right? Our minds naturally organize and identify common features among objects we see. Now let's define a cluster. It's simply a group of objects that share certain properties. In this case, some points are denser and more closely packed together while staying far from other groups. That's essentially what our brain does. It offers a clustering solution for free. But here's the catch. When you're dealing with a lot of data or complex structures, it's not so easy to spot patterns at a glance. That's where programming steps in. So let's shift gears and solve this problem with code. We'll start by randomly selecting three points from the set and assign each one to represent a different cluster. These will act as our initial cluster centers. To visualize this, I'll use different colors to show which points belong to which cluster. Right now, we've only assigned the three chosen points to clusters, but there are still many points without labels. Here's how we handle that. For each unlabeled point, we'll calculate which of the three initial points it's closest to. Once we've identified the nearest cluster center, we'll assign the point the same label as that cluster. For instance, if a point is closest to the blue center, it'll join the blue cluster. We repeat this process for all the points, labeling them one by one. By the end, we'll have a first draft of clustering for our data with every point assigned to one of the three clusters. This approach gives us an initial structure to work with, but as you'll see, there's more to refine. In practice, there's room to refine our clustering solution and make it more accurate. Here's how. Rather than sticking with the three random points we initially chose as cluster centers, we can calculate new centroids. A centroid is simply the average position of all points within a cluster. By recalculating these centroids, we shift from random guessing to a more systematic approach. This is the key idea behind the k-means method. It's called k-means because it revolves around calculating the mean or average within each cluster to determine a new centroid. Once we have the updated centroids, we repeat the process, assign each point to the cluster with the nearest centroid. Even after just one or two iterations, this refinement often leads to a much better clustering solution. It's a simple yet powerful idea that builds on itself to improve the results. Now that we've covered the concept, let's move on to writing the actual program and putting it all into action. Let's get everything set up for this episode by organizing our work and creating a clean virtual environment. First, we'll create a dedicated folder for the project and name it Naive Score K Means. Inside this folder, we'll set up a virtual environment using the command python -m venv slash venvutils. This creates an isolated Python environment, ensuring all our project dependencies are kept separate from the global setup. Next, we activate the virtual environment. For most systems, you can do this with source venvutil slash bin slash activate. If you're on Windows, the command is slightly different. Venvutils scripts activate dot bat. Once the virtual environment is activated, we're ready to install the necessary libraries. We'll use the following command, pip install numpy, pandas, plot9, scikit-learn. This installs all the tools we need. NumPy for numerical operations, Pandas for handling datasets, Plot9 for creating visualizations, and Scikit-learn for working with clustering algorithms. With everything installed, we're ready to dive into the coding. At the start of our kmeans.py file, we import the essential libraries for our clustering program. First, we have NumPy, 
which we'll use for numerical calculations, such as generating random indices and working with arrays. Next, we bring in Plot9, a library for creating elegant and customizable visualizations. It's inspired by the grammar of graphics and will help us plot our clusters. We also import Pandas, which will be invaluable for organizing and manipulating our dataset during the clustering process. Finally, from Scikit-Learn, we import Make Blobs, a function that allows us to generate synthetic datasets with clusters. This is perfect for testing and demonstrating how the k-means algorithm works. With these tools in place, we're ready to move on to building and visualizing our clustering solution. Now, let's generate our dataset and get it ready for clustering. We start by using Make Blobs from Scikit-Learn to create a synthetic dataset. Here's what the parameters do. N samples equal 100 generates 100 data points. Centers equals three, specifies that the data will be grouped into three clusters. N features two, makes each data point have two features so we can plot them on a 2D plane. Random state equals 42, ensures that the data generation is reproducible, giving us the same results every time. Next, we normalize the data by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation for each feature. This scales the dataset, making it easier to process and ensuring fair comparisons during clustering. Finally, we convert the normalized data into a pandas data frame, naming the columns x1 and x2 to represent the two features. This gives us a clean, organized structure to work with as we implement the clustering algorithm. To get a quick look at our dataset, we use print x.head. This displays the first five rows of our data frame, letting us verify that the data has been generated and normalized correctly. Each row represents a data point with two columns, x1 and x2, corresponding to the normalized features. This step is useful for debugging and ensures that our data set is ready to move forward with clustering. Let's visualize our data points to see what we're working with. Here's how we set it up. We use gg.ggplot to create a plot, specifying x as our dataset and mapping x1 and x2 to the x and y axes, respectively. gg.geompoint is added to represent each data point as a dot on the plot. gg.chordfixed ensures the aspect ratio is equal, meaning the units on both axes are scaled equally for accurate representation. Finally, we use gg.thememinimal to give the plot a clean, simple design, making it easy to focus on the data. By calling ggplt.draw show equals true, the plot is rendered, showing us the raw distribution of data points in 2D space. This gives us a visual starting point before we apply clustering. Now, we're preparing our data set for clustering by adding a new column called cluster to the data frame. Initially, we assign every point the label zero, indicating that no clustering has been done yet. When we run print x.head, again, we'll see the updated data frame with three columns, x1, x2, and cluster. At this point, all points are unassigned, but this column will later store the cluster labels as we progress through the algorithm. This function, getRandIndXes, generates random indices from a given range. It's a helper function we'll use to randomly initialize cluster centers for our k-means algorithm. Here's what it does. The parameter n specifies the total number of data points available. The parameter k defines how many random indices we want to generate. Using np.random.randint0n size equals k, it returns an array of k random integers between 0 and n minus 1, representing the indices of randomly selected data points. This randomness is essential for the initial step of k-means, where we pick a few points to act as the starting cluster centers. Now, let's set up the initial cluster centers for our k-means algorithm. First, we fix the random seed to ensure our results are consistent every time we run the program. Then, we randomly select three points from the dataset using the getRandomIndexes function. These points will act as our starting cluster centers. Next, we extract the coordinates of these selected points and store them in the centers variable, which represents the initial positions of our clusters. Finally, we assign cluster labels 1, 2, and 3 to these points, marking them as the representatives of their respective clusters. This sets the foundation for the clustering process. Now, we want to visualize the clusters again, but with some updates. Building on the earlier scatter plot, this version maps cluster to the color aesthetic so that each data point is colored based on its cluster assignment. We've also added scale color manual to assign custom colors, red, blue, and green for the clusters. 
These adjustments make the visualization clearer and help distinguish the clusters more effectively, while the rest of the plot setup remains the same as before. Now we want to calculate which cluster each point belongs to based on the nearest center. This function, getClusters, computes the cluster assignment for every point in the dataset. First, we extract the coordinates of the data points, x, and the cluster centers as NumPy arrays. Then, we calculate the Euclidean distance between each point and every cluster center. This is done efficiently using array broadcasting. Finally, for each point, we find the index of the nearest center using argmin and return the corresponding cluster label 1, 2, or 3. This function provides the backbone for assigning points to clusters based on proximity to the centers. At this stage, we determine the cluster assignment for all points in the dataset. We start by using the getClusters function, passing in the data points and the current cluster centers. This function calculates the distances and identifies the nearest center for each point, assigning it a corresponding cluster label. Then, we update the cluster column in the X data frame with these labels, ensuring every point is grouped with the cluster it's closest to. This step helps refine the clustering as we progress further. Here, we define a function to calculate the updated cluster centers. The getCenters function works by grouping the dataset by the cluster column. For each cluster, it computes the mean of the x1 and x2 coordinates, effectively finding the new centroid. Finally, the function returns these updated centers as a data frame, with the index reset for cleaner processing. This step is crucial for refining the clustering process as it recalibrates the cluster centers based on the current assignments of points. Now, we update the cluster centers using the getCenters function. Now, we want to visualize the clusters again, but this time we're adding the updated cluster centers to the plot. First, we prepare a new data frame, Centers for Plot, which includes the recalculated cluster centers and their corresponding labels. This ensures the centers are properly formatted for visualization. In the updated plot, as before, data points are plotted and colored by their cluster labels using geom point. We add a second geom point layer for the cluster centers, making them larger with size equals 5 to distinguish them from regular data points. The rest of the plot setup remains consistent. When the plot is rendered, you'll see the current clustering along with the refined centers, giving a clear view of how the clusters are evolving. Here, we run the iterative process of k-means clustering. In each loop, we reassign clusters based on the nearest centers. If the cluster labels don't change, we stop the loop. Otherwise, we update the cluster centers and repeat. This continues until the clusters stabilize, giving us the final grouping of points. Here, we've reached the final step and can now visualize the result of our k-means clustering. The plot shows the final clusters with each data point color-coded based on its assigned group. This plot represents our final result, clusters that have stabilized after the iterative k-means process. It gives us a clear and polished view of how the data has been grouped. Thanks for joining me in this episode where we took a deep dive into the k-means clustering algorithm. We walk through the entire process from initializing cluster centers, iteratively refining them, and visualizing the final results. Along the way, we explored how simple concepts like distances and averages can solve complex grouping problems. Whether you're learning clustering for the first time or looking to sharpen your skills, I hope this episode gave you clear insights and practical tools to apply in your own projects. Stay tuned for more episodes where we'll explore even more powerful techniques and applications. See you next time.